So, good afternoon, and I would like to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, special edition of our WIPO Economic uh, Seminar Series. Uh, it is a special edition because uh, we are um, presenting today um, some of the results of our um, first uh, phase CDIP project on IP and socioeconomic uh, development. Uh, um, we do have a number of, of, of external speakers, uh, but it is also a bit of a self-serving seminar in the sense that we present uh, the result of uh, uh, some of our own research. Um, in a sense, um, this seminar summarizes uh, research uh, that uh, was initiated uh, more than four years ago, uh, so indeed it has been a long road to, to get uh, here. It has uh, also been an exciting road. Uh, I think we've, we've learned a lot uh, since uh, we started uh, with this. Uh, we also have benefited tremendously from partnerships throughout the world uh, with uh, some of the governments we've worked uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the researchers uh, we worked uh, with, uh, and I think also the purpose uh, of the seminar is, of course, uh, we don't have the means to bring everyone to Geneva, but at least uh, some, um, some, some of our partners. Um, I won't say a lot at the outset. Uh, I'm going to be the timekeeper for today's seminar, which is going to be quite important uh, because uh, we have a loaded uh, program, as you can see from the agenda. What I would like to do, however, is uh, to introduce uh, some of my colleagues uh, here at WIPO, but also uh, the external speakers uh, who have been involved in this um, research project on IP and socioeconomic development. So I particularly want to mention uh, Julio Ruffo, uh, who's a senior economist in the um, Economics and Statistics Division, and in fact, he was originally hired uh, for this uh, project, uh, and he found it so interesting that he decided to, to stay on. I also would like to mention my colleague, uh, Sasha wunsch Vincent, who's sitting there in the back, uh, who has been involved in uh, uh, two of the studies. Uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Intan Hamdan Libramento, who is uh, sitting in the first row here, um, who was involved in, 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 the, in the project in Thailand, my colleague Hao Su, uh, who was involved in the project uh, in, in China. I also especially want to mention my colleagues uh, Samye Figueredo and uh, Katarina Valles Gamez, who have provided tremendous administrative support uh, throughout uh, the whole project. Uh, so there were a lot of workshops, there were a lot of contracts uh, that um, um, uh, were um, issued as part of that. And I think without Samia and Katarina, we would not have been able to do all of this. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, we worked uh, with uh, governments uh, in six countries, and uh, also we worked uh, with uh, local researchers, we worked uh, with international researchers, and I think uh, um, you know, that, that was a really enriching experience. Uh, and I think on behalf of the many people who are here, I'm you know, at least able to welcome uh, some of them, let me start on my left, is uh, Graziella Succolotto, who is a researcher at, at IPEA, at the Institute uh, of Applied Economics uh, in, in Brazil, and she's going to um, present some of the work uh, that uh, we've done in, in Brazil. I should better say that uh, she has done in Brazil. Uh, to my right is uh, Catalina Olivos uh, from uh, the National Institute uh, for Industrial Property in, in Chile. Uh, and she's going to take the perspective of a policymaker um, who, um, you know, was involved in the research, but also was involved in in using the research. Uh, and um, from um, China, we uh, have uh, Professor Hui Zhu, and I, uh, of course, uh, ask for your forgiveness if I mispronounce your name, uh, who's from the Research Center of the State Intellectual Property Office uh, of the People's Republic of China. Uh, you know, we um, had a very interesting collaboration uh, with SIPO uh, as part of this uh, country study project. And in the end, I will give the floor to, to Pierre Monen, who was one of the evaluators uh, of the project and um, who, along with Daniel Keller, presented uh, the report's evaluation report at uh, today's uh, CDIP meeting. Uh, now, that should be it for the introduction and the outset. Uh, I'm going to ask Julio Raffo um, to um, simply provide an overview of the project. Uh, we don't have uh, you know, the time here to do full justice to all of the studies that we've done, uh, so he's not going to go study by study, uh, but instead he's um, um, going to try to give you some of the you know, thematic avenues that we explored as, as part of this project. So, Julio. Thank you, Carsten, and thank you to all our colleagues and our partners during this very interesting and long 42 months. 
So we started this project in July uh, 2010. It was approved in April 2010, but we started in July 2010. And um, we, um, as part of the development agenda recommendation, we tried to address two of those recommendations, namely 35 and 37, which, if you allow me the shortcut, basically wants to provide evidence and, and economic studies on socioeconomic development. This is how we frame the project, and I should have done this to give you a precise background. Um, so in concrete, this meant conducting six country studies. We're going to have um, presentations for three of them today, and I will give an overview that will make not full justice, as Carson was saying, to the other three. Um, and we concluded the project in December 2013. So the um, main motivation of the, of the project was, first of all, try to provide some answers about MP and socioeconomic development, but with the approach knowing beforehand that we cannot think that there's only one solution. And we try to be very open-minded in our approach. You're going to see in the following slide. In particular, we also wanted to provide some support to policymakers giving them tools that are going to be able to be used for the design and implementation of those policies. Um, this, of course, has shown uh, us early on in this project that we should invest a lot in, in, in data because th there is a lot of discussions on IP uh, and economics, but often that discussion is not supported by data. So we tried, and sometimes this is, means putting the cart before the horses, but we try to provide as much data as possible. Um, and I hope I'm going to make a convincing argument that we produce way more data than actually we could analyze. Um, so, as I was mentioning, the project approach, we can divide it namely in two main avenues. The institutional, which try to be very, very broad, and we started always by reaching um, the main stakeholders of each of the country studies that were uh, requested by each member state. Um, actually, we have to decline some of the, of the request, because at a certain point we were too, too many requests. Um, in, in, in that approach, we reached not only government agencies that were related or interested in specific questions relating IP and, and economics, or socioeconomic development more specifically, but also we tried to engage uh, private sector, academia, as much as, as we could. And I think we were quite successful. Um, typically, in, um, I would say that basically in, in, in all six countries, we started with a small workshop where we invited uh, countries, um, governments, and, 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 and stakeholders to participate and bring their questions, but also to give us useful feedback about the data. Um, and and with, with that feedback and knowing exactly what data was available and what were the interesting questions for them, we tried to narrow down to a couple of specific questions that were also useful for the broader uh, membership of WIPO, because we knew from the beginning that we only were going to conduct six studies, so we cannot only address the questions that were specific for those countries. Um, in terms of the other uh, aspect of the approach, the methodological one, we, as I was mentioning before, we invested a lot of data. So basically, we relied uh, as much as we could in what we call unit record data or micro databases, namely IP data, the patents, the trademarks, register or applications, but also some economic data at the level of firms or, or economic agents, and for instance, researchers, if you had the, the, the possibility of access. Um, this implied um, a lot of efforts of, of data matching. I'm not going to go through them, but I invite you to look each of the, of the studies. I would say that namely most of them, if not all of them, have a thick annexes where we try to explain very carefully what we did in terms of data and, of course, the limitations that this implies. In those cases that we couldn't rely on, on, on micro data, we relied, of course, in some, some more aggregate available data, but then we complement that what we call case studies, which means doing extensive interviews with stakeholders trying to get as a much complete uh, uh, answer to, to the question, knowing that, of course, relying on anecdotal evidence is always a limitation. Um, so, this is a summary of the outputs that, that we did, and I'm not going to make justice in, in what remains of my presentation to them, but I invite you to go and, and, and look at uh, them in detail. Um, 
Most of them, basically all of them, have been presented in the CDP. Some of them are going to be discussed during this CDP uh, because they have been submitted uh, to the last CDP but they couldn't be discussed or because they have been submitted to this CDP. And I invite you to, to look at them in detail. I'm going to now give a, a very short uh, summary on, on some topics uh, of, of in a more cross-sectional way, if you allow me, of these studies. Again, I'm not making justice, hopefully, Graziella and, 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 and Hushi and Catalina will make more justice to the specific studies, and I invite you to go see them in, in further detail. So one main avenue that we have explored is how much can we map IP use by using these micro data sources. Basically, we have two strategies and a complemented uh, third one. The, the, the one, for instance, that Graziella will present some results on this is using existing microdata, namely innovation surveys and industrial surveys, to characterize how many of, of, of the population, for instance, in this case, population of firms or industrial firms, use or do not use a certain IP, right? There is some strength of, of, of doing that approach, but also some limitations. We hope that those limitations can be compensated by actually a very different approach, which is create an IP statistical uh, database from the unit record data of IP. And this is what we did, for instance, in Brazil, Chile, China, Thailand, Uruguay. And actually, to be fair to China, China did it itself. So we, there was a, a, a huge leap forward for us when we reached China. That data existed already, was constructed, and actually some surveys were conducted, which relate to the third pillar I'm mentioning here, which is expanding these IP statistical databases with economic data. So in the case of China, for example, they have conducted some very interesting surveys of, of users of the IP system, of applicants of the IP system. So with that, we believe we can create a lot of information to, to characterize, but also to, to test and to verify uh, different ideas for policy making. A second um, result that we had, uh, and also by design from the beginning, is that we found that there is a lot of uh, sectoral specificity, right? Sometimes, and, and that relates to what we say, that one size does not fit all. So sometimes what a certain sector needs, the other one might need a different requirement. One example is what we did in Uruguay for the forestry chain. Even if that was a case study, we discovered there that they have huge cycles of product innovation. So since we discover a new seed that is going to be and generate a very specific tree for the forestry uh, sector, the, the, that tree can only be used in the paper mill or, or, or in, in a wood-related uh, um, sector only 15 to 20 years afterwards. So of course, there are many IPs that cannot be suitable because by the moment you can verify if it is, is useful or not, uh, you cannot enforce your IP. Uh, but this was not only the results. Also, by doing uh, the extensive mapping that I was mentioning before, we discovered some very interesting results. For instance, Graziella will mention, uh, and I, I, I'm making a scoop of what he, or she's going to mention uh, soon, is that the services uh, um, sector in, in the Brazilian uh, industrial, industrial service show a more intensive use of patents than the low manufacturing sector, which is something we don't expect. Usually service sectors do not use IP much unless trademarks. So that's a very interesting result. Um, similarly, we have seen, and that has been pointed by, by the distinguished delegate of, of Chile, that the mining sector in Chile is the most intensive user of patents uh, from resident patenting. So that was a very interesting result that we were not looking at the beginning for. Similarly, we find the, uh, a result equivalent for the Thai food industry uh, in the use of utility models. And also, we have seen that the national companies, or pharmaceutical companies in Uruguay, they use a lot of trademarks. That was not something that we were expecting. They're, they're very intense users of trademarks in, in, in Uruguay. And um, maybe um, Mrs. Khrushchev will, will speak about this. But also, we found that the, the ICT sector um, is the most foreign-oriented of, of all the sectors in, in China. That was not something that we were looking at specifically, but we found that in our results. Equivalent, we, we found some results in terms of IP and economic performance, and a certain link. As, as we, also, we always mention, we have to be very, very careful about establishing a causality of this. But we do find a strong correlation. Um, I believe that Graziela will present some results on this for Brazil. For instance, we observe that usually uh, users of the IP system perform better in many indicators than non-users. That doesn't mean that they are perform better because they use IP. But we do know that if they perform better, they will use IP. 
So that's an interesting result. This is equivalent for Brazilian exporters, and, and we also find an equivalent result for in Thailand for utility models. Last, um, we also find that the microeconomic behavior in terms of IP, if you allow me a little bit the jargon, basically how agents, uh, inventors, entrepreneurs, but also firms, how they react to policy or to particular environments, uh, they, they do change in terms of their strategy. For instance, in Brazil, we see that firms that have IP, they do collaborate more for achieving innovation. That's an interesting result. Uh, Again, causality is, is to be established there. We are not arguing causality, but we do observe that. Similarly, we saw that uh, the in Chileans um, or companies filing for trademarks in Chile, if they are quoted in their trademarks, they behave substantially how they, they, they file trademarks in the future after being quoted. So that's also an interesting result. Um, we have similar results in terms of utility models uh, in Thailand, and we also have seen in the case of Uruguay that a policy change, in this case uh, on, on pharmaceuticals uh, patents, uh, has shifted completely the, the kind of patents that the Uruguayan IP office received uh, in terms of technologies, namely more pharmaceuticals than other technologies. So, in conclusion, I hope I... I, I I did a good um, job in convincing you that we generated a lot of new empirical insights, um, particularly that we can go very narrow in our analysis, going to the firm level, to the applicant level, to the sectoral level, which often is not possible with aggregate data. Uh, we certainly have generated more data than we can analyze, and that we believe that this is an outcome of the, or an output, if you prefer, of the project itself. And, and, and we're really happy to, to see that most of our partners have appropriated those results from themselves and they carry their own research, which will only uh, benefit the general discussion. Um, we also know the limitations of what we did, both in terms of data creation. We cannot say that we have covered every single IP form on every country and every sector, nor we can say with the analytical results that we have uh, um, completed the discussion about ampian development, nor established a causality. You have to be very, very humble there. Uh, but we, we see as a positive feedback, um, and, and we saw that a little bit in evaluation, that beneficiaries of, of the country studies were very, very happy, and they are keep contacting us for, for doing future work. So that means that, that they, they have a strong interest in this, but also we receive a lot of new requests. And, 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 and we think this is a good sign that at least we're going in the good direction. Thank you, Carsten. Thank you, Julio, for this uh, overview of uh, the project, uh, which was you know, really aimed at um, you know, um, giving you a general idea of, of the overall project. Uh, now, the idea is to you know, focus on, on two of the studies. Uh, you know, I don't think there are any particularly strong reasons uh, aside, I think, you know, from, from, from the availability of the authors and their willingness uh, to travel to Geneva while we selected uh, those. Uh, one is uh, on um, um, Brazil and the other one is China. And I would uh, first ask Graziela to uh, present uh, the work that uh, she has done uh, for Brazil uh, under our project. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Karsten and Hafu for this invitation. I'm very glad to be here. And so here we're going to present the results for the Brazil. Uh, in the case of Brazil, we prepared two reports. So in the first one, it's basically some descriptive statistics about IP in Brazil. It's a more general idea of how IP works in Brazil. And in the second one, we present a more detailed analysis of the relationship between IP and the export performance of Brazilian firms, as Rafa said. Especially in the second case, we were very interested in studying this because the Brazilian government <coughs> was very interested in, in understanding this relationship to understand how IP can impact on export performance and on, on, on the competitiveness of the Brazilian firms. So that's why one of the reasons we decided to study this, this subject. Uh, first, the database we used in both studies. First, we used the WIPO database that is available online, which shows some general indicators about IP in Brazil, basic indicators about uh, uh, invention patents, utility models, industrial designs, and trademarks. And uh, as Rafa said, we also used the Pintech database. Pintech is the innovation survey in Brazil. 
So it, it includes all the informations about for information about R&D, yeah, innovative expenditures, cooperation, everything about innovation we find we find in this pink tech survey. It's very similar to the CIS database yeah, people using in Europe. And uh, we used three editions of pink tech, 2003, 2005, and 2008. And we made some analysis, some sectorial, regional, and firm size analysis. We analyzed the innovative expenditures of firms that use IP, the cooperation for innovation, the public incentives for innovation, and we also could characterize the firms by, for example, orange of capital, foreign trade, and employee skills. And we crossed this database, this Pintec database, with the Brazilian export database and could see a, a big panel of the IP information in Brazil. Um, as Half said, we don't have time to present uh, all the results of the report, so once again, I invite you to, to go to the WIPO website and see the report. But here we're going to present uh, some of the main results. Uh, in the case of the sectorial analysis, for example, uh, we can see the percentage of innovative firms that use IP methods, uh, applicability methods. And we can see some results. For example, as in many other countries, the trademarks is the most relevant type of IP used in Brazil. In all sectors we analyzed, we can see the results by sector in the report. And we also saw some sectorial difference in the use of IP methods. For example, high-tech industries, they use more patents than the innovative services, and these one use more patents than low-tech industries. You can see also the results in the report. And we also saw that the design complexity and lead time, which we consider informal methods of probability, they are not frequently used by Brazilian firms. You can uh, find some of the results in other countries. It's very easy to compare Brazilian results with many other countries. They are very similar. Um, in the case of the regional analysis, uh, in Brazil we have a very strong, concentrated, productive and innovative uh, structure. And we can see that production is very concentrated and also the IP activities are very concentrated. And if we see the, the green part of the graph, we can see that more than 60% of IP users are in the southeast of Brazil, especially in the state of Sao Paulo. Most of them are in the state of Sao Paulo. And in the last period, this percentage increased, we can see in the graph. Um, by firm size, we can see that uh, uh, a growing tendency, a growing, uh, a growing tendency uh, in, all, in all types of IP in all types of IP. You can see that the case of patents, trademarks, and design, the uh, uh, larger firms, they use more all types of IP methods than the small firms. And it is valid for all types of IP methods. And so, uh, so it's something that we, we, we have to pay attention that in the case of small firms, uh, the, the, the small firms, they use more trademarks than other. And then the other types of IP. For example, in the case of large firms, the difference between the use of patents and trademarks is not so big. But in the case of small firms, this difference is, is much bigger. So the firms start to use IP, uh, and they start, when they start to use IP, they start to use trademarks. That's something which is very interesting in this, in this graph. Well, we also could characterize the firms crossing the pink tech information with other databases. And we could see that patent users, users, they perform better. So in general, the patent users, they are larger, if you consider revenue and number of employees. The patent users, they export more. They, ha they present higher R&D expenditures. They also cooperate more. And they also use more R&D incentives. We say in Brazil that the best firms are the best. So the firms that use IP, they have all the other good economic characteristics. But something that is very, very important in this slide is that we are talking about correlation. We are not talking about causality. For example, I'm saying that a firm that uses a patent is larger. But I'm not saying that this firm is larger because it uses patent. So there's, 
uh, there's a, a correlation, uh, it's a correlation, it's not a causality relation. It's very impor important to say that. Um, and in the second report, uh, we analyzed the relationship, as I said, between uh, IP and export performance of Brazilian firms. And we saw that in many countries, we saw a strong relationship between innovation and exports. So innovative firms, they tend to be more intensive in exports. And in Brazil, the data shows the same results. So innovative firms, they present better export performance. And we evaluate the export performance using three variables. The probability to export, which, is, uh, which means that higher percentage of innovative firms are exporters the value exported, exported value, and the firm's participation on sectorial exports. And you see that, uh, if you can see this table, in all the cases, the, the innovative firms, they present a better export performance, they export more. So uh, the main question is, as the innovative firms present a better export performance, Maybe these firms present this better, perform, uh, better export performance because they use IP methods. So uh, do innovative firms that use appropriate methods as patents, utility models, industrial design, and trademarks, they present a better export performance? That was the main question of this, this study. And uh, I, I, once again, I can present all the results and the, the methodology. We don't have time to, uh, for that. But in the report, we explain it in detail. But just a simple table to show the relationship between exports and uh, IP methods. And we can see that uh, in uh, every case, the exporting firms, they use more all types of appropriate methods than no exporting ones. For example, the first, uh, the first number, 17% uh, of exporting firms, they use invention patents, while only 3% of non-exporting firms, they use invention patents. So it's valid for all the other types of uh, IP methods. Um, again, uh, sorry, I can't, I don't have time to present the methodology, but the main result of this test is that we found when you control by order of capital, the use of uh, innovation, uh, the, the, innov uh, the innovative expenditures, when you control for all the other variables, we, we found a positive a correlation between invention patents and all export performance variables. So we didn't find a very strong, a very robust result for the other variables, for utility models or industrial design, for example. But the, the, the most important relationship we found was between invention patents and export performance. And we also present in the report uh, the analysis of some additional variables. We, did, uh, we mainly focused on exports, but we tried to analyze some additional variables, for example, as market share. And once again, we found a, um, a positive and strong correlation between these other variables and invention patents. So this is the main type of IP we could correlate with economic variables in Brazil. Um, in the case of future studies, uh, our main suggestion is to include our PTO database that we couldn't use in this, uh, in this time. Why? We, we, we would like to match the PTO, our PTO database with Pintech because Pintech itself has some advantages. For example, uh, Pintech, we, could, we can compare the formal methods of appropriation with informal methods. For uh, example, industrial secret, we, we can compare. But Pintex has some limitations. For example, we don't know the number of patents per firm. We don't have this information. We don't know if the patent is, is used in Brazil and or abroad. We don't know the time of protection. We don't know if the patent was applied uh, uh, 10 years ago or five years ago. We don't have this information. And uh, the database is too short. We have now we have only four editions. So it would be very nice to include the PTO uh, information, the PTO database with Pintech to improve the results of this study. I think that's it, thank you.
Thank you, Graciela. In, in the interest of time, I suggest that uh, we um, uh, leave uh, time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, so I suggest we first go through the program, and in the end, uh, I will open the floor to uh, all of you to pose questions. Uh, so let me invite uh, next uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Hui Chu from uh, the Research Center at uh, SIPO to present uh, the um, research work uh, that um, um, was done in China, in particular, on the patent, patenting strategies of, of, of Chinese firms, uh, which, as, as Julio mentioned, was uh, all based on a, on a really interesting and comprehensive uh, patent survey uh, that uh, SIPO now has undertaken for a number of years. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Um, I'm honored on behalf of uh, our, our group to share our researches with all of you. Um, and last year, Intellectual Property Development and the Research Center of SIPO conducted a project supported by uh, WIPO. They study on patents role in Chinese business strategies. And this analytical study um, was conducted on the basis of the survey of patents in China from 2008 to 2012. Today, I'll introduce the survey of the patents in China um, briefly, just from the following aspects. Uh, SIPO of China commissioned the survey of Chinese patents in 2008 uh, in order to shed light um, on the patenting behavior of the inter, uh, enterprises, universities, uh, research institutes, uh, and individual inventors in uh, China. And uh, the survey was designed and uh, conducted by intellectual property and uh, intelle intellectual property development and the research center with the assistance of the local intellectual property offices. And uh, the survey um, has been um, conducted uh, six years until this year. <coughs> And one of the most important uh, parts of this survey is sampling, and sampling frame, sampling method, and sample size. Uh, in the past five years, we took the granted patent as the sampling frame, and uh, but this year, we make a big change of the sampling frame. Uh, from the granted patent to the valid patent holders. And the method of the sampling, which, uh, because, they, um, because the sam sampling um, frame is very big and uh, it's multi-levels, so we take the probability proportionate to size sampling as the method of sampling. In the past uh, five years, from 2008 to 2013, um, we drew about uh, 40,000 patent, patent samples uh, every year, um, which belongs to about uh, 15,000 patent holders. Um, and the sample coverage rate um, decreased uh, just because the uh, amount of the authorized patents uh, increased quickly. And uh, it decreased from about 14% in 2008 to 3.5% in 2000, um, in last year. And this year, we drew more than uh, 18,000 
patent holders uh, with the valid patents as the samples and uh, which cover about 3% uh, uh, of the total sampling frame. Every year, the investigation recovery rate uh, is above 80%. So we have a very high recovery rate of our survey. And the content of this survey uh, just including two parts. The patent holders and about the patents. Uh, about, the, about the patent holders, we inspect three as, uh, we investigate three aspects of the information. The basic information about the patent holders, um, such as the firm size, uh, types, and the R&D inputs, etc. And, uh, and their patenting mo motives, why they uh, apply for a patent, and uh, what will influence their <laughs> patenting behaviors, and the patenting propensities. And about today, particular patent, we just collect the information about the patent production, how to get a patent, and what will you cost, the, the time, input, capital, input, and the human uh, resources, etc. And the most important part is the patent use, how to use your patent to transfer licensing or make products. And then we also investigate the patent incomes and the benefits from the patent use. Um, the annual survey content uh, would change just according to some new questions, problems arise uh, on that year. After six continuous years investigation, uh, we have established a big database, uh, just including information about uh, more than 100,000 patent holders information and more than 200,000 patents information. Now that's a very big database. Uh, how to use it is uh, important. And in turn, this enables us uh, to analyze the uh, patent behaviors uh, of the uh, enterprise universities and uh, individual inventors um, as uh, evidence. And also, uh, it provides reliable um, basis uh, for the government uh, decision making. And uh, we have done um, uh, some analytical studies just based on this database, uh, such as this uh, project uh, supported by WIPO last year. They study on patents role in business <laughs> strategies. We just uh, used the uh, data of, of the, the form. Patenting motives information and the patent um, implement, uh, use information. And according to our study, we conclude uh, Chinese companies apply for um, patent just uh, mainly for the, their implementation, how to use it, um, to use the product, uh, to use the patent to, to protect their products in the market, uh, to occupy the, um, to get more share of the market. Just uh, look at the, uh, the first. I think you have the laser we can point it with. This. this? Ah, thank you. You're welcome. This, uh, 
they use the patent to occupy the market in advance. And uh, they protect their technologies, just uh, prevent others imitate, imitate it. Um, but uh, more and more uh, companies uh, start to explore their strategic um, purpose, mo motives. Uh, such as they take um, patents um, as they to cross licensing um, and uh, look at this uh, they take patent patents to as they uh, technology stock file uh, stock pile and uh, this is to uh, incorporation into standard of the patent pose. And uh, in this chart, um, we just uh, make some comparisons uh, between different types of enterprises. Uh, the big size, the medium size, or small size. And uh, <coughs> according to this study, the large size of the enterprises have more stronger strategic um, motives uh, of their patenting behavior. And this is the The patenting motives comparison from 2009 to 2011. Uh, that means the strategic um, use of the patent uh, become um, more and more popular, and the patent implementation rate uh, is very high, especially for the Firms, uh, the total implementation rate is above uh, 80%. And that's uh, uh, the one conclusion that um, the firms apply for the patent just uh, for uh, implementation, protect their products. <coughs> that's the main conclusions of our study. And in future, we'll go on our survey uh, of patents in China, and uh, we try our best to collect more scientific and accurate and uh, first-hand data of the uh, patents and the patent holders' behaviors. And uh, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thank, uh, thanks all the facilities of the meeting. <laughs> Thank you for uh, this presentation on, on China. And I should say that, uh, you know, uh, because of time limitations, uh, we're not able to present all the results uh, that uh, you would find in the study. And indeed, the China study, you know, um, is, is of course uh, much uh, richer uh, compared to, to what um, and Professor Xu could uh, pr present uh, today. Also, I should say, with a um, survey response rate of more than 80%, I think you make, uh, I guess, uh, researchers from all over the world uh, jealous. Um, now, um, let me um, invite uh, Catalina Olivos uh, from uh, the um, Public Policies Department uh, at INAPI uh, to take a slightly different perspective. Uh, Kata contributed to, to some of the studies we've done, but more importantly, she had the role of coordinating uh, the research work uh, with us, uh, with uh, uh, various uh, govern government departments in Chile, with other stakeholders, and also thinking about the question, well, what is it that, uh, uh, in this case, the Chilean government uh, would like to get uh, out of the research, and how can this be used uh, in the policymaking process? Uh, so, um, you know, along these lines, I would like invited, uh, I would like to invite Kata to, to share some observations with us. Thank you, Karsten, for your kind words. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm not an economist. I'm just a lawyer, mm -hmm. so I will do my best 
but I want to speak a little bit about why we have chosen Chile for this study. Of course, it is a decision of WIPO, but why it was interesting to, to analyze the changes also in a country like Chile. I think it's important because nowadays Chile is considered a medium-high income economy as from 2013. And this brings about different consequences and analysis uh, that we are undertaking in Chile. Also, it's important to have in mind that the uh, IP is regulated in Chile in a law enacted in uh, 1990, which has pioneering in many aspects uh, within Latin American countries at that time. But this law has to be improved and updated, of course. Um, we believe that at this point we need a new and more flexible law, uh, which may reduce procedural delays and costs for benefits of the IP users. Uh, we understand that we have to incorporate the internet facilities for our users, and that's why we have a draft law in Congress now. Thirdly, uh, it's important to have in mind that we have a new IP framework in Chile. INABI was created in 2009 and is a rel relatively new institution. Uh, and we, we changed from having a merely registration system in Chile uh, to have an office with more faculties and especially in the international field uh, in charge of advising the president and also the Ministry of Economy. And of course, uh, it's important to highlight also that we have more faculties in the field of transfers, transfers, or transfers of law, knowledge. So we are working uh, on having uh, also, all the information of patents, which has fallen into the public domain, uh, available for all the users. After saying that, uh, it's important to know also uh, how was the preparation of the studies. I don't want to get in details about it, but it's important to have in mind that we decide to become part of those uh, WIPO member states where some research can be conducted in the economic field. And at that time, in Api, we, uh, we realized in INAPI that it was important to, to have, uh, it was needed to have uh, basic information and data, as well that impact analysis um, on issues related to IP, to IP for the creation of this new institution in Api. Now we can say that most of this information is avail available for us because of the work done in the context of this project. So we are really, really uh, grateful to, to have it. Uh, all this work was conducted in the area of industrial property. We have two institutions in charge of uh, intellectual property, one and the other one of industrial property. So our studies are not in the copyright field. Uh, the study begins with some interviews, as you may uh, see in the slides. Uh, I think it was a very, very important part of the, of the study. We had interviews with the stakeholders, with the agencies in charge of innovation, with some part of the academia in, in Chile that also work uh, in the IP field, with IP lawyers. So we had a, a great framework of what uh, was needed to, to, do, to, to be done on, in Chile. Without entering into details, it is important to highlight, uh, highlight the exhaustive work that we have done in this, in this area after these interviews. We also start uh, to have a look of our database. Um, so after, after the interviews, we start the process of cleaning our database. I think one of the main problems faced by patent and trademark offices is the management of information they own and uh, they recover from the IP users and passing through its standardization, maintenance and updating. So after WIPO work, uh, we think we are available to obtain a better standardization and updating of our data. It is also important to, to highlight that I will not speak about the data process of cleaning, but you can see uh, more about it in the uh, document CDAP slash 11 inf 4. Also in this document, you can see uh, more about the 
first project that, project that we have in the studies about a characterization, a description of the Chilean IP system and the utilization of IP in Chile during the period of 1991 and 2010. This is a very important period for us because it was a critical period in Chile because it represents the first 10 years of democracy after the military government which ruled the country since uh, 1973. The legal reforms on our law are relevant during this period, so it was very important for us to have a view of how uh, IP users use their system. Some of the more interesting findings of this first uh, study uh, were regarding the IP system. It was to uh, uh, understand how was the institutional environment working at that time and analyze the weaknesses and the strengths of our country in the IP field. Uh, everything analyzed was very consistent uh, with our vision of IP in Chile uh, and helped us to reaffirm some of the initiative that we have undertaken at that, at that time, for, uh, at this time, for example, our draft law. Um, we are introducing, uh, we are improving procedures, we are reducing administrative delays and fees, as well as giving protection to different type of trademark, for example, for, example, for smell trademarks. Uh, we were able now to reaffirm our perception of the low capaci capacity we have to use utility models and industrial design as tool for protection of IP rights, and we are working on a strategy for enhance this work in INAPI. It's also important that, uh, that we have a characterization of the user of our system, and we are working uh, on, uh, on <coughs> giving them more uh, tools for working on the IPS strategy. And after that, this was the first uh, project that we have, and then we have the trademark squatting evidence from Chile and the pharmaceutical patents in Chile. I will not get into details also in, in these two projects, but I will say some, something that is important for us after that. Um, the trademark squatting will be, be presented in the CDAP on Thursday, so you can also have a view there for, about the, the study. Then, after the work done jointly with WIPO, we have realized that it is indispensable for us uh, uh, to have access to economic research to inform our decisions and measures. Um, and, of course, uh, likewise, our international public policy department today relies a chief economist, as we have said in the plenary before that. Uh, in charge of providing support, uh, supporting um, and necessary evidence about the measures we are undertaking in Chile. Especially regarding the work complete with WIPO and the opportunity to have a chief economist in our office exclusively dedicated to carrying economic research um, related to IP, we have aid uh, to begin with the better base uh, for designing our national strategy of IP. This is the main goal that INAPI uh, has for the years to come, is to have a new strat uh, uh, strategy for, uh, for our country. Um, we identified together with WIPO the areas where uh, the highest number of trademarks and patents applications were filled, and we analyzed some of their consequences. That's why you can found, you can found in the two studies that we have. Also, now, after the studies, uh, we are able to observe that there exists almost no link between the system of industrial property and the regulation of contracts of the agencies in charge of the public funds in, on the innovation field. So we are also working with all these agencies for having a, a structure about it. Uh, this permitted us to access information which is fundamental for a large project that we have initi initiated in design, establish an industrial property policy for the years to come, as I said before. Uh, but the work did not end there. After the, this characterization of the system, the two studies conducted were also very important, particularly in the area of trademarks. Uh, the proposed model uh, developed under the squatting study seems to us a very interesting uh, study because it allows us first 
uh, to realize that the work we are doing uh, is in the right direction because the model places in evidence that this illegal uh, behavior uh, exist but in a small percentage in our trademark uh, application. In the area of patents, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical sector is where we have the highest, highest number of application in our country. And this is why uh, we are interested in know more about these applicants, and uh, how we can improve the innovation in our country. As a conclusion, uh, we are, would certainly like to extend our appreciation uh, for the work comp completed by WIPO. We believe that uh, this has been a contribution to our activity in the area of public policy, of course, and will help us to develop better services to our, our users and have certainty about what we need to, to do in the IP strategy. We hope that this work may continue to be developed in our country, especially in the field of the mining sector, as we mentioned before, because it's important for us to understand uh, the, our applicants in these sectors. And also, we are sure that we can share this information with other IP offices that will be also very uh, interested in the mining sector, like uh, Australia, Brazil, South Africa, etc. So I don't want to be burdening you with more uh, information, but I think it's important to highlight that we can now have more clarity about the measures that we must undertake in, in the public policy field in IP office, uh, in the IP office. So this is why we are very happy to have these three studies. The last one is being reviewing, and we hope to present it as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catalina. And I think in the case of Chile, and I think that also applies to Brazil, we were especially happy about the fact that uh, INAPI created a chief economist position and a similar, similar or equivalent position uh, uh, was created uh, in, in, in Brazil at uh, the IP office there. And, uh, you know, that is good because it, um, you know, obviously I have a biased perspective, but I think as far as the, you know, sustainability of the work uh, that we initiated, especially the data uh, work is concerned, uh, I think, you know, this is, this is a really positive uh, um, um, development, uh, and I certainly don't want to claim that you know this is an outcome of our project, but it's it's certainly a really welcome uh, de development, and you know we really look forward to interacting with uh, um, you know both Chile and Brazil in the future on on on, on all kinds of uh, research uh, initiatives. Um, now, um, as I mentioned, in, in the, the first phase of this project uh, came to an end operationally at the end of last year, and as a standard practice uh, with uh, all CDIP projects, uh, they're independently evaluated, and we had the pleasure this morning of uh, listening to the evaluation report uh, that uh, was prepared by Daniel Keller and Pierre Monen. And um, I think, first of all, the evaluation report itself provided uh, valuable evidence uh, on the impact uh, of the study work that we've done, uh, but it also made, I think, a number of really um, constructive uh, comments uh, uh, that uh, uh, we um, will be able to take into account uh, in uh, the envisaged second phase uh, of this uh, project. Uh, but I think also this seminar is a, is a good opportunity um, um, to sort of reflect on, you know, what uh, has gone right and, uh, you know, what uh, are the, the kinds of things that, that uh, you know, maybe did not work out that well in the first phase where we could do better. And in this regard, uh, we invited Pierre Monen to share some of um, the, uh, his thoughts on the project uh, uh, with us. As I mentioned, Pierre, uh, he's a professor at uh, UNU Merit. Uh, he's an economist uh, who very much talks uh, the same language uh, that we do. Uh, he has looked at the overall project, and you know we are very curious to have his views on you know what he thinks were were, were uh, successful, useful elements of the project, and what we could do better in the future. So, Pierre. Thank you, Gaston. Um, let me uh, give you a, a few remarks about the utility of this kind of project. And by the way, what I'm going to say is also shared, I think, by Daniel. So part of these thoughts are also joint thoughts with Daniel Keller. 
Uh, first of all, um, what is what I consider, what I find, found the most interesting in this project was the construction of a database. Uh, a and especially, I think, the two countries where it has been most developed was Brazil and Chile. And, and also a very nice, um, in the appendix of these papers that you refer to, a very nice description of what were the problems with these data sets and how some of these problems have been uh, corrected and all the effort that has been done. For instance, a big problem is the, the name associated to a given patent. Right? That name, a company may change names over time. There may be uh, spelling mistakes. If you, if you compare the name that's reported on the patent with the official name of the company, right? There may be, uh, as I said, differences over time. There may be differences in the name of that same company that is associated to the patent and that is associated to the trademark. So all these problems have been tried to be settled as much as possible. And given that, there exists now a nice database uh, that allows a certain number of questions to be asked. Like, what are the kinds of intellectual property rights that are being used? Is it more patents or is it more trademarks? And what we have often found is that trademarks is the most used uh, method of appropriation. Now, trademarks is quite a different thing from patents. Patents are used uh, to protect your, uh, your invention. So for a certain period of time, you have the monopoly. You, uh, only you can produce that product that has been patented. Right? So it's a way to recover the initial investment you have made, and it gives you the incentive to invest to invest money in research and development. That's the logic of patents. And at the same time, it also, to some extent at least, diffuses already the knowledge that is um, contained in the patent and can maybe in this way uh, be a building block for future patents. Trademarks are quite different. Trademarks are used to give a certain logo or to give a certain name to a product, like Coca-Cola or Siemens, and you have this picture of Mercedes-Benz. These are trademarks. Trademarks are mainly used as a strategic purpose, as a marketing tool, right? So it's not exactly the same thing. And you see that in many countries, especially in, in uh, um, developing countries, trademarks are much more used than, than patents. You try to look for patents in certain countries, you find very few patents, but you find a lot of trademarks. So the first thing is then to, to be able to, to have a, a, a picture of what are the types of property rights that are being used. Then you can also look at what are the technologies in which patents or trademarks are <coughs> mainly used. Uh, and, and you can make, make a relationship between uh, the intensity of uh, use of, uh, of property rights in certain fields, in certain industries, and for instance, the export composition of the country. Is there a link between the composition of exports in terms of industries and the composition of patents in terms of industries? And that then allows at least economists to, to ask the question, what is the source of international trade? Is it comparative advantage, or is it advantage in technologies? So that's the sort of thing that you can answer once you have the data for that. Also, uh, who are the applicants? Is it uh, a resident or is it a non-resident? What has been found in, in some of these studies that a lot of uh, patents are also used by non-residents, multinational firms. Uh, is it used by universities, individual researchers? Is it used by researchers in collaboration? <coughs> So joint patents, and that tells us something about the way innovation occurs, the way research is being done. Something about the geographical distribution, so are, are certain states more active than other states? Sao Paulo, for instance, is a state that's much more active than other states. And what are the different routes through which patents are being applied? Is it a direct route? You directly apply to your own patent office, or do you go to the PCT route? So these kind of things are quite interesting, and, and, and that's something that you, you can do once you have set up this data set. And that's why it's so important to have this data set. The second thing is the relationship between uh, property rights and, and some other variables. I already mentioned the relationship between pat, uh, property rights and trade. But also you can look at the relationship between 
patents, for instance, in R&D? Is there a link between the amount you spend in R&D and the output that you see in terms of patents, so-called, what is called in the literature, the knowledge production function? Or you can compare the output in terms of patents with the outputs in terms of products that are brought on the market, so-called the share of total sales due to new products. That's a variable that is contained in the innovation service, like BITEC or CIS, or, or, or similar surveys in China. So compare different outputs of innovation. That gives us a better picture, because patents, to some extent, are used strategically, are not just used to protect property rights, but are also used as a tool of competition, to preempt competition or uh, to prevent other people to, to, uh, to uh, to, to give less incentives for other people to come and, and compete with you. So there are strategic ways in which patents are used. And it would be interesting to see to what extent is it strategic, to what extent does it really correspond to what in theory uh, we, we had in mind by devising the patents. And then finally, you can look at the link between patents and productivity. Productivity finally is one of the major components of economic growth, at least 50% of growth is due to productivity. To what extent is productivity explained by research and development? But it's not just research as such, but also the output of the research, and patent is a measure of the output of that research. Now, as uh, Carsten Fink said uh, this morning in, um, in the plenary session, is that it's difficult to, to talk about, you know, have to be careful in, in uh, assigning uh, causality by looking at relationships between uh, patenting and, for instance, productivity and so on, if you have just a cross-section. Because basically a cross-section gives you a correlation, but you can hardly uh, establish the causality, link of causality. Is it from A to B or from B to A? Now, if you have a data set like the one that has been constructed in, in, with this project, and you keep that data set updated. After a while, like you have, for instance, in China with that uh, patent survey, you have a so-called panel data. You have uh, information on the same uh, firm, but over time, <coughs> over a certain number of years. And then you can then uh, link productivity today with patenting two or three years ago, or R&D of uh, three or four years ago, and patenting today. And then you can already have uh, you know, a, a link of causality due to the, f the fact that some variables are predetermined with respect to other variables. So that's why it's important, I think, to keep up this exercise. So that would allow us in medium term also to do some serious analysis and rigorous analysis of uh, causality. So I think the, um, the, the various studies that have been done, a nice thing was I think the idea not to have a, a, a common framework for all the studies, but for every country, uh, there was a discussion with the, uh, the, uh, the stakeholders of that uh, particular country, and the institutions are different. Right? In, 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 uh, if I remember well, in Brazil, you had a, a number of, of, uh, of institutions that are connected to, to, uh, to, to patents. Uh, you don't have just one patent office, but you have different offices, I think, which made it a little bit difficult at the beginning to, to, to get all these actors together. Well, institutions are different in different countries, and that's why maybe the same model shouldn't be applied to all countries. And it was a good idea to have a different, to ask different questions and to have a different approach for each of these projects. And uh, although in general one always thinks, okay, you have a common model, you apply the model to to different data sets, and that allows a better comparison. But I think in this case, it was really a good idea to, to have a different approach uh, for every country. Um, for the case of, of China, I think this, uh, this survey is quite interesting. Um, but what is also interesting is to establish, and I think some people are already working on this, and maybe Saipo is working on this, is to do the link between the different patents and uh, the, uh, the surveys that you have on, and the enterprise survey and, and other surveys that you have that allow you again to link microdata from different sources and because that would then give you more of a census kind of information and not just a sample. Although the sample might be representative and so on, but still it's, it's just a sample. And uh, unless you 
you, you follow up the same firms year after year. What happens, unfortunately, very much with the innovation surveys is that precisely the same firms are not followed year after year. But every year or every two years, you do a different sampling. And then it's unlikely that the same firm will appear in every successive wave. And if you don't have this, then you cannot construct this, that famous panel data set that allows you to do dynamic analysis and causality analysis. So that's why the census might be quite interesting. And you could also, in parallel to this uh, survey approach, also do the census approach. Um, I think that would be quite interesting. So I think I, I, I'll stop there with my remarks. <coughs> Thank you, Pierre, for these uh, observations. Uh, let me sort of half open the floor in a sense that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll open the floor to questions from the audience, but let me first invite a number of representatives uh, from the beneficiary governments uh, to ask if, if they want to make uh, statements. Uh, let me start with Ambassador Francisco Pires uh, from Uruguay, uh, if you would like to make an observation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good, af good afternoon, distinguished delegates and WIPO Secretariat. On behalf of the government of Uruguay, I would like to thank WIPO and the CDIP for the opportunity to be part of this project in the framework of the development agenda. Our government truly appreciates the work carried out by WIPO under the leadership of Mr. Castern Fink and succeeded by Mr. Julio Raffo. So many thanks to them. Uruguay recognizes that country studies are important tools to enhance knowledge on the impact of the IP system, particularly in developing countries. Since 2005, the government of Uruguay has prioritized the promotion of policies on science, technology, and innovation on the understanding that uh, there is no development without innovation. Thus, the Intel Industrial Property Office is working to promote the strategic use of IP instruments to support innovation and competitiveness, competitive advantages. Particularly important is the policy vision in this sense, in the last decade, Uruguay has reshaped its public health system, integrating medical care institutions, health maintenance organizations, and public insurance. So in this context, the pharmaceutical sector is very relevant. Patents in Uruguay come in a high proportion, more than 80% from the pharmaceutical industry or related, in addition, the majority are requested by non-residents, most of which come from countries outside of the region. In this regard, the Ministry of Industry, Energy and Mining requested the Director General Francis Garry to participate in this project. The first exploratory mission was conducted in order to discuss the terms of reference of this study gather information from different sources and actors, identify existing quantitative information sources, as well as exchange views from interested parties. Following this mission, WIPO prepared a document containing a proposal for a study, defining information to use and the technology to be applied. This proposal was discussed with uh, WIPO representatives and national authorities had the opportunity to make suggestions and comments, and then it was sent to different stakeholders to seek their views. First, this study should determine what the specific changes happened in the sector after the new patent law came into force in the field of patent application. Part of the major players' market and the introduction of new products. Secondly, the study should aim to quantify the impact of patents on the pharmaceutical market conditions. The Industrial Property Office had an active and engaged role in this research, providing free access to that database, facilitating further information from different sources, studies, 
available of the sector and coordinator interviews and related activities. In October 9th took place a national presentation of the results of the project organized by the DNPI, that is the National um, Industrial Office. I would like to emphasize that the national authorities receive the versions of the study in advance and then they provide suggestions and comments to clarify some questions and to contribute supporting the conclusions. The use of national data based on IP and innovation produces information that could be useful for future initiatives, research and purposes to explore the relation between IP system and innovation. The methodology applied would uh, be employed in other studies related impact of IP. The results of this study provide useful information on IP and innovation environment and better understanding about the pharmaceutical industry behavior. The study is very important and will provide inputs for developing <coughs> sectorial strategies and will help to take decisions at national and international levels. To finalize, I would like to express that this study enforce recommendation 35 of development agenda. The, um, to conclude one more time, I want to thank you, the WIPO Secretariat for their contribution and um, this is uh, all what I have to say for, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for these extremely generous uh, comments. Uh, let me next invite uh, Clayton Schenkel from, from the Brazilian uh, government uh, to provide a view. Thank you, Chief Economist, and uh, thanks also to all the presenters and the uh, evaluator. Uh, the uh, one I read this, this studies, it, it reminded me of one saying that we have in Brazil. It says that uh, if you don't know exactly where you are and where you want to go, every path you take will be potentially wrong. I think that's the, the best thing that these studies can do for our countries, is to provide this picture, to know better, uh, this, the, 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 have, have a clear picture of the, the relationship between IP and uh, the development and uh, the, the exporting capacities and all these items, I think this surely helps the policymakers in uh, dra drafting the des their decisions. And uh, in this sense, I would like to re reiterate what I said in the morning about the appreciation of um, our, our, our government. Uh, our government, and uh, I think this was reflected uh, in the responses that we got from the, the institutions that were involved. Uh, the, the Institute of uh, uh, Research that is here represented by uh, Ms. Graziella is one example, but you have others like this in the, the IP office, the, the statistics uh, institution. I think all of them are grateful for the, the help and the cooperation. If you allow me, just a few points on each of the, the, the studies. On the, the first one, on the relationship between IP and export, exporting performance of, uh, of Brazilian firms have three points and I think they are interconnected. The first is, well, already highlighted the cooperation with the institutions was mentioned by Graziella, the Pintech, which is the technolo technological innovation survey. In the studies it mentions the limitations, but even with that, I think it, it shows, it allows for monitoring the evolution of uh, the use of IPRs in private sector in Brazil, in, uh, this is, this is uh, innovative in, in, in the country. The second point is uh, when you mentioned in the morning to be uh, that, uh, well, it was the studies were careful in the inferences that they made. I think it, it strengthened the, 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 the points that were made if they shows, they, 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 they are clearly just to give an idea and to allow for the, the conclusions, and uh, I think this point is related to the third, that is recognition of the limitations of some items. In this, it was mentioned by Graziella that some of the indicators that are used have, has, has, uh, they have to be used carefully 
because they have certain limitations. I think this point, when you, when you provide one picture and you know exactly to where, to, to which point it can be used, it, 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 it can provide for, for some conclusions. I think it, it, it helps even better the, the policymakers. About the, the, the second study on uh, IPUs uh, in, uh, in, in general, uh, it, was, it, it provided for a, a comprehensive overview of the use, the, the use of IP in Brazil. And it was particularly important in the sense that uh, it was used, it provided for the creation of a statistic uh, database it's uh, BADEPI, the Brazilian acronym, and uh, some of the information that was was gathered using this database is uh, is it, it is is innovative, in the sense that for the decade that it 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 encompasses, uh, it it uh, applied to all the industrial the all the industrial IP uh, assets in Brazil. Some of them, I will not go into the details, but some of them, for example, uh, the, we have uh, 38,000 uh, patents deposited, and uh, we, it was already intuitively uh, known by Brazilians that most of them were by non-residents, but we didn't know exactly the details on uh, the percentage, so I think it is, is certainly helpful. And uh, finally, you mentioned that sus the sustainability of the project, and we received from the IP office, for example, some information that they created an internal structure to reproduce this, this methodology, and it's already bearing fruits. We have now monthly statistics and uh, annual compilation of these uh, statistics, and uh, this information, this data, is being shared with uh, research institutions, mostly universities. And uh, also, it's, it's being cross-referenced with data from other organizations. So in uh, uh, one of the results of this cross-references is to, to permit to understand, for example, the profile of the, the IP users. I think for all these reasons, these studies were very <laughs> helpful, very productive, and the uh, Brazilian government is thankful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Um, Felipe, would you like to say something? Felipe Ferreira of uh, the Chilean government. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we would like to thank the speaker for the very interesting presentation and to the secretariat for the organization of the seminar. Um, we think that Catalina has already highlighted the importance of the studies conducted by WIPO in partnership with our National, you know, National Industrial Property Office. Um, the databases generated by the projects are important, and the studies also help us to understand the importance of the economic analysis in order to take public policy decisions. We believe that it's important to recognize that beyond the income classification, there is no one-size-fits-all process of development and therefore, there is room to improve our public policies and institutions. WIPO has been a key actor in the IP area. Finally, we would like to thank WIPO for their work, and we look forward to keep, developing, to keep working uh, together in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felipe. And with that, let me open um, the floor to everyone. Uh, invite you to make comments or ask questions. Uh, the only thing I would ask you, if you um, um, raise your hand, please identify yourself so uh, that everyone knows who you are. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Kasten. My name is Madeleine Sharp. I'm a president of Health and Environment Program, NGO based in Cameroon, and also have uh, of an office in Geneva. My question is uh, about uh, collecting data. I would like to know how academics and, and universities uh, going to the field, uh, is it uh, only the government who recommend uh, uh, those institutions or also some NGOs or NGOs in some countries can be involved? And, 
I would like to know if you, you, you find or you verify that uh, civil society uh, is involved uh, on these uh, matters. Thank you. Thank you for, for this question. Let me maybe try to give an answer, and I would, could also invite Julio to, to compliment if he has any additional thoughts on, uh, to that. I think, first and foremost, you know, we work with governments. I think we initially sit down with governments and you know, listen to them and see what you know, are their interests as far as policymaking is concerned. And I think the next step then is, is, is to consult uh, beyond government. Uh, and I think you know, that uh, very much includes uh, NGOs of, of various types. Uh, um, um, so you know, I think there I certainly see, see involvement. Uh, I think as far as the conduct of, of the research is concerned, Concerned, uh, um, you know, I, I think you know we primarily have worked uh, with uh, with uh, researchers, research institutes, economists, you know, who um, you know have the have the relevant skills. Uh, so, for example, in a number of countries, I think IPEA is actually a research institute that's affiliated with the government. But we've also worked uh, with uh, with independent research institutes uh, in Thailand, for example. We have worked uh, with a with a Thai development uh, research institutes. Uh, um, and you know, to the extent uh, that you know any type of organisation has, has has skills to offer and has the competence, uh, you know, to to assist us in our work, I think uh, we we're definitely um, open to it. I think it, it really depends, you know, on a country by country basis, you know, who has the skills and experience uh, to to contribute. Um, so that would be my my perspective on this. Uh, okay. Any other? Pedro. Uh, thank you, Karsten. <clears throat> I think thanks, thanks, thanks to the speakers. I think it was extremely interesting, all the three cases. Uh, something that was mentioned by, by all of them was utility models. And uh, Catalina mentioned that it was an institution that was not well used or there was not enough information. My question is in relation to China, because China well, is well known for uh, patenting activity. And I don't, my, my question relates to in the data that was collected on patents, utility models are included, or you have a separate item for that? Pedro. Before turning to China, let me just point out that we had one study um, uh, among the six country studies that exclusively focused on utility models, which is the study that we did in Thailand. Uh, and I think you know there we are trying to ex we exa tried exactly to get at the question that you posed. That in a sense that you know a lot of people um, you know have observed that you know utility models are maybe a form of IP protection that especially suits. Uh, let's say, the uh, type of innovation that is being conducted in many low- and middle-income countries in the sense that they protect, let's say, smaller, more adaptive in innovations, inventions that, you know, don't necessarily have to meet, you know, the full inventive step requirement uh, that you would find under regular patent law. And um, I still, the jury is still out there. I think the Thai study is very interesting in a sense that, you know, I think on the one hand it showed that, you know, it did, I think, fulfill the objective that the Thai government set itself when it started uh, with utility models. You know, they introduced it at the time they implemented uh, the reforms, um, you know, to become TRIPS compliant. And they, you know, essentially thought that, you know, regular invention patterns are mostly used by non-residents. We need a form of protection that, you know, sort of uh, uh, targets uh, Thai companies. And in that sense, it, it was really successful in a sense that, um, you know, I think more than 90% of all utility model applications in Thailand are by Thai residents. And the numbers are are substantial. You know, there are a number of, of, of sectors, uh, industries, sub-industries that make heavy use of the utility model system. We also looked at the performance of firms in relation to utility, utility model use, and I would say, you know, we did see some encouraging signs. Our results, you know, do suggest that, you know, after the first time a company uses utility models, uh, they record better performance. 
But we do have the, 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 the causality caveat uh, in respect of this result that I already pointed out. So, sorry, this was just a little bit of advertisement that, you know, one of our study very much dealt with utility model. But I think your question was more specific to China. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry <laughs> about uh, uh, whether um, my answer will um, uh, reply your questions. And uh, um, we just uh, uh, investigate uh, the patents granted um, every year, and including three types of uh, the patents, uh, of course, including the utility model and the uh, an invent invention um, patents and uh, the uh, designs and uh, but uh, um, the utility model uh, I think utility model system is um, uh, um, important um, kind of patent in China. Uh, especially for some small size uh, enterprises and uh, individual um, inventors, and uh, but uh, according to our uh, but according to our survey, um, I I have this. Okay. This is the chat. This one? Uh, yeah. And this uh, this is the. I couldn't understand that. <laughs> 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 uh, this is the invention patent, and this is the uh, utility model, uh, and this is the design. That's the implementation rate of different uh, um, patentees. And uh, there's the different types of the uh, patents they hold it. And uh, uh, utility model and design is um, important uh, for the firms. <laughs> uh, um, maybe um, I, I, I don't know the, <laughs> the reason why it, is, uh, it has the higher um, implementation rate, but uh, that's the uh, Facts. Maybe that's um, more um, easy to make products. Um, and uh, um, for the universities, um, that's different uh, conclusions. Um, we can understand um, the invention patent um, is easy to be uh, licensed or transferred uh, to others. Yeah. And, uh, Oh, we can see the individual, um, for the individual inventors, um, the designs is an um, important types of patent to be used. Mm. Um, I think, I don't know whether I just uh, answered can I you. Can something person on the, on the point? Sorry, I'm hiding here. <coughs> Let's see if this is good enough. Um, related to what Pierre Morin said, very he kindly said in, in, in his uh, exposition, we tried since the beginning to be as, um, as broad as possible also about IP, because most of economic studies in the past have focused on patents. We try not to fall in that trap, of course. In some aspects, we are, we are constrained by data availability and, and what actually is important for the sector. So building on, on this question by, by, by Pedro Rofi on utility models, let me add that the Brazilian uh, statistical database contains information on utility models. The Chilean, I believe, as well. The, the Uruguayan uh, that we did for the pharmaceutical study also contains data. Interesting, and of course China that was just mentioned, and Thailand, which is specific to utility models. So what we found is that while in Brazil and, Ch and China there's a, a considerable, substantial use by residents of, of utility models, we do not find the same in Uruguay and Chile. And uh, that was an interesting result. While in Thailand, by the fact of applying the new regulation, there was a substantial use by, by residents. So I believe that also is part of the interesting results that we cannot fully depict given the richness of the data, but I think that's interesting that we see that an instrument that should be more or less the same 
depending on the country, on the size of the country, of, of maybe the sectoral uh, specialization of the country, we have substantial difference of how they use the, the, a particular IP instrument. Okay, I think we would have time for one more question. Yeah, I'm Akir Mgonja from Tanzania, and uh, I thank all the presenters for their wonderful job. But let me quickly, because of time, uh, ask whether uh, they had how they dealt with the challenge of collection of data. Uh, in my perception, collection of data in public institution is uh, straight, but when it comes to private sector and especially in industries. Sometimes it's uh, difficult because they will be hesitant uh, to give information, thinking that we may share with the rival or competitor. So how did they deal with this um, uh, challenge, if at all, they experienced this challenge on collection of data? Thank you. Let me try to give an answer. I think it's a, it's a, it's a really important question. Um, I think... Part of the answer is that um, you know, a big focus of, of the studies that were done here made use of the data that is generated in IP offices. Uh, and you know, at one level, IP offices are an extremely rich data source because whenever a patent or a trademark um, is filed, uh, you know, they, leave, they leave a statistical trace uh, that analysts uh, can make use of uh, and we can learn something from it. The challenge is that you know, the way that data are often organized and also the way, let's say, the patent operations, trademark operations, and so on work, it's not meant as a statistical collection process. So often, you know, one has extremely rich raw data, you know, unit record data, um, that um, you know, is quite difficult to use. And, you know, that not only has to do with IT issues, with software issues, it also has to do with some of the challenges that I think Pierre mentioned, uh, applicant name harmonization, and, uh, and also carefully understanding, you know, what are rather complex data sets. And I think, you know, what we try to do is essentially to, you know, take an extract of the operational data that exists in, in, in IP office and make, make it available in a form that, that economists and, and you know, other professionals can do, do research with. Uh, I think as far as other data beyond IP are concerned, we mostly work with other official statistics. And I think there, especially data that are compiled by national statistical institutes uh, that have under national laws the mandates to conduct surveys and where quite often also companies are under a legal obligation to respond to these surveys, uh, which in a number of countries, you know, has, you know, raised questions of data confidentiality. Often um, companies are required to respond to the surveys, but, um, you know, the, the, the information on the individual companies is not disclosed for the reasons uh, that you that you mention, and um, you know that has you know often requires sort of creative solutions either to anonymize the data or you know the Brazilians have I think an excellent system where system where researchers can go to the National Statistical Institute and they can work with the data and they can do research there. Um, and they can sort of publish the aggregate research result, but they're not allowed to take, you know, out individual records or, you know, disclose information on individual companies. Uh, so one has to think of, of creative solutions there. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Okay. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Let me, um, you know, first of all, thank all the presenters uh, that um, presented today. Um, let me also again thank all the um, people, you know, here in Geneva and in, in the six countries uh, that we worked in um, that were involved in these studies. I think, you know, this has been a great experience. Uh, we are now in the fortunate situation that uh, the CDIP this morning approved the second phase of the project, uh, so we are going to continue with this work. And I think, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, we have a lot of ideas. We also have a lot of lessons learned, but I think events like this are extremely useful in, in sort of reflecting on, you know, what we might do in the future. Um, I finally would like to point out that uh, I think except the study that, that Catalina mentioned on Chile, all of the studies are online by now. Um, you can go to our website. Um, um, if you go to the main WIPO website, you know, there um, is a section on policy 
um, you know, where economics uh, is, is, you know, falls under, you can also search, just search in Google WIPO economics, you would find us. Go to development studies or go to publications and, you know, you would find a page uh, where um, all of the studies uh, um, 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 should be um, available. I should also point out that all of our economic seminars also record it and we post them a day or two later on the website uh, so that uh, people, especially in developing countries, uh, um, you know, have, uh, uh, have access uh, to the debate that is uh, taking place in our seminar. Uh, so with that, let me thank you all for your attention and uh, let me wish you all a, a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.